Great, great. Well, this is a, an actually a really interesting and exciting time to be talking about exchanges. And I know that for some that may sound like an oxymoron or something, but if you can think about it, here we are, really 13 months to the day from when they really have to go live. We're on the eve of new uh, proposed rules that were released last night, and from the looks of all of your eyes, you spent the entire night reading that. So I anticipate some really, really good questions as we get into that, and I'm sure Shakita looks forward to those questions. I, I want to talk a little bit about exchanges, not necessarily from a technical perspective, but to give a little context of how did we get where we are, right? The, you know, exchanges have become such a political lightning rod. I want to talk about what they really are, where we are today within states, and then also kind of the path forward. So with that, I'll kind of go to my first slide here. If you look at this slide, really this slide is intended to, to really talk about where we are as a nation and how we've, how we've kind of continually added more and more with respect to um, benefits and, uh, and safety net. Uh, I won't go through this uh, kind of line by line here, but what I think some of the takeaways here are that it hasn't happened overnight and it hasn't been necessarily driven entirely by states or by the federal government and its cross-political parties, but really a, a desire as a nation who has increasing resources to, to share that has been a kind of a compassionate path that we've been on, not for a couple of years, but literally for decades. So this next slide is really what I will call a eye chart. So you, um, every, every consultant right, has to have something like this to talk to, but this is kind of a framework that we at Levitt Partners put together as the Affordable Care Act first pass. I don't want to, want to talk about the specifics here other than I, the takeaway for you ought to be that really exchanges didn't get created or thought of in a vacuum. They really came about over decades to solve a problem in the market. And as such, you really need to start to think about them not as a, as a synonym for, uh, for the Affordable Care Act, or for or something else, and as a result, a lightning rod. You really need to think of them really more like a tool. So my um, my first takeaway here for you, I'm going to have three of them. First takeaway is really that exchanges are not a product of the Affordable Care Act. In fact, if you go back historically, they've been around, like I said, for decades. You can go back into the early 90s when Ira Magaziner and Hillary Clinton contemplated using them in the reform that they proposed in the mid-90s. If you accelerate a decade into the early part of this century, you'll recall that the Heritage Foundation looked at exchanges as a market tool. Then roll forward, you had two states that really experimented with them. They were kind of at the bookends um, at that point in time. Massachusetts, of course, was the first, and Utah was the second. I would, I would, um, I would say now that they're no longer the bookends. There are states that are further to the right and further to the left of both of those states. But really, this has been an evolving process. So let's go to next kind of takeaway for exchanges. Exchange is a tool. That's all it is. It's not a, it's not a like I said earlier, a synonym or anything like that. It's a tool, and the stakeholders get to decide how to use it. Okay? So when you start thinking about exchanges and you start to think about, okay, does one state-based exchange look like another, and how does that then compare with the federal model or the federally facilitated exchange, it's really a tool and the stakeholders decide how to use it. And you, as decision makers, get to decide to be a part of that process and to decide how to use it, or you get to decide to really defer that and let the federal government come in and tell you what they would like you to have your tool look like. So um, Shakita ably went through some of the timelines associated with where we are today. Uh, let me just c give a couple different points here. Right, so today, here we are um, at the first part of December. That, sec that first bullet there talks about the guidance and the, the proposed rules that have come out. That's over 1,000 pages of proposed rules between the, the, the earlier one in, I think it was November 20th, and then the one that came out yesterday. A lot of reading there, and, and much of that's been long awaited for, and it'll help decision makers make the decision. Uh, the, the actual decisions with respect to what a state chooses to do Governors have to write letters. Originally, those letters had to be written by the 16th. Of course, we saw the politics play out earlier this month, and that be delayed, and now we have a decision that has to be made by the 14th of this month, two weeks away from today, right? That's when states must declare if they're going to build a state-based exchange. Some people ask me, well, is that decision already done, right? Could a state actually, if it hadn't already done things, could it still make that decision? to build a state-based exchange at this date? Could they do it? Could they make the, the timeline? 
You know, that's a tough question to answer because every state is different. But I know from a technology perspective, if a state chose to do it today, they could still do it. It'd be a heavy lift. There wouldn't be a whole lot of time to, to kind of daddle around and, and, uh, and play around with, with decisions, but a state could still make it. Most states that will make that decision to go with a state-based exchange have already been on that path. But still, for states that are choosing not to make that, there's still a big decision between a partnership exchange and a federally facilitated exchange. And I'll talk a little bit about some of those nuances in a minute. As you, as you look underneath there, that kind of remaining regs to drop, of course, the rules that just came out are proposed. Shakita talked a little bit about the comment periods. These comment periods are pretty, pretty narrow, so you need to, to weigh in quickly. But then they'll quickly go to final rules. And that will happen over the, the kind of a really a 60-day time frame between when comments are received and then the rule is put out. As you start to look forward going beyond that, you start to get into this fiscal cliff negotiation. I would, uh, I would argue that really we've watched exchanges go from being the main topic to being really kind of put on the back burner as we've started to talk about deficit and debt and the fiscal, the fiscal cliff. That doesn't mean exchanges aren't important and the decisions and the timeline isn't still accelerating. It just means that there's something else kind of taking all the oxygen in the room. Um, I kind of put down there at the bottom recognizing that we've got 50 different states with different legislative session timelines. I've just kind of put that as a, as, a, as a block there because clearly the legislatures have a significant role to play in here. And I would actually argue that in many cases that's been a stumbling block for exchanges to be pushed forward because what has occurred, if I look back over just the last few months, in many cases governors have gotten to a point where they have been just about to make a decision and then some faction of the legislature will step up and say, but what about this? And in many cases, they're not necessarily talking about the substance of the tool. They're talking about the politics that maybe the tool has been um, for the last year or maybe even two years has been really dragged into. It's more the lightning rod as opposed to the actual tool itself. So where are we? You know, how many states are going to do state-based exchanges versus partnerships versus the federally facilitated? Tough to tell. I know there's another handout here which has got the, the map with different shades. But really, as we look at it, we think that about a third of the states are in a position to do state-based exchanges. And in, in many ways, these are states that, that really clearly know what they want and are driving towards it. In some cases, it's a, it's a partnership between the legislature and the executive branch. In other cases, one is leading and the other is, is kind of deciding where they still are. I'll tell you, I had an interesting conversation with Steve Larson, who was a former colleague of Shakita's about a year ago at a, at a think tank meeting. And then we talked about why it was that at that point, which seemed late at the time, why had states not made decisions um, about exchanges? And as we talk through it, really one of the things that is clear is that as a decision maker, as a legislator, or even as a governor, one of the things that as an elected official you have is you have your decision. And once you make your decision, it seems to be that there's a perception that you've lost the power, right? That you've, you've made the decision and should something else come out, some data come out, that the opportunity to make a decision has passed. Unfortunately, that doesn't always square with timelines. When you have to build technology, when you have to engage stakeholders, when you have to do something, and it's not something that you just flip a switch at the very end, sometimes that decision-making process gets extended and it overlaps with the actual implementation timeline. I would advocate or argue that we are well past that time. And hopefully people are at a point where they're able to make decisions. About maybe five to 10 states will go do partnerships, and then there are many states that will actually defer to a federally facilitated exchange. And ironically, many of these states are the states that, that, that least want that option. These are states that most want the state-based um, route because of the control that they're able to retain. But yet they may ultimately defer to a, st to a, to a um, federally facilitated exchange because of their inability to make a decision. As you start to think forward, um, HHS has laid out uh, an option for states to go from a federally facilitated to a state-based exchange in the future. That sounds really easy. It's not. And the reason I say that is because once you have technology in place, implemented, to think that you're going to rip that out and then start anew and then design your state-based exchange or partnership 
is, is a little bit of a, a fallacy. So I would just argue to anyone that thinks they can defer the decision and do a federally facilitated for the first year and then easily shift courses later on, rethink that decision because that is not as easy as you may think it to be. Um, final kind of bullet here on this page is what states must weigh in terms of making this, this decision. Two he things here I think are the key ones, administrative and operational costs. The guidance that came out yesterday suggests that a federally facilitated exchange will cost states about 3.5% of the premium to run. So what does that mean? Is that expensive or is that not expensive? I would argue that that's more expensive than it needs to be. And it, states can do it less expensively if they choose to and if they act. Um, there are some options that you can do it less, significantly less expensively, but that's uh, that's up to the state. I'll kind of tell you a, a little story here, if I will, just to kind of make this point. If you had a really rich, rich uncle who just won the Powerball lottery, and he came to you and said, hey, I just won $500 million or whatever it is now in the 231, I think it is, take home if you take the cash option, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm here to, to pay for your new home for you. You get to design whatever home it is that you, you want, and I'll pay for it. Only catch on this is, I don't know how long this Powerball money will last. And if history is any indicator of that, it'll probably last a few years and then I'll be broke and I'll be buying more lottery tickets in the future. So you build the home you want, I'll pay for it, but you've gotta, uh, you've gotta pay for the ongoing maintenance of this. Now there's some of you that might say, this is my big chance. I want a 10,000 square foot home, I want a 10 car garage, I want sky ceilings, you know, I want the whole bed, I want two pools, an indoor and an outdoor, we're going all out. And so you build that dream home. Someone else may say, you know, for my needs, I need about maybe 2,500 square feet. You know, I, I only have two cars, so I'll, I'll do a two-car garage, and I'm gonna do a lot, you know, I'm gonna do solar panels on the top, and I'm gonna go really lean. Well, both of you have, have not spent any of your own money, but as you go forward in the future, there's a dramatic difference in what you have to spend to maintain and to operate that home. Exchanges are very similar. Some states have, have applied for significant grants, and as you look at the grants in terms of the cost per, um, per citizen of that state, they've been very significant. Others have said, I'm not as concerned about the upfront costs, I'm more concerned about the ongoing costs. I think that's a key thing that states ought to be concerned with, and they ought to throw in that, that, uh, that mix, if you will, what the federally facilitated ongoing costs will be. Think about this not as what your costs are in 2014. Think about what they are in 2021 because that is what your citizens will be paying as an ongoing basis. Let me now go to my kind of third takeaway f with respect to this presentation. So, you know, we talk about the exchanges. We talk about kind of them being the, the decision point. But I would argue that the other rules that are coming out have the potential to be even more impactful. Oh. There we go. How about there? Thank you. So as we go forward, these other insurance reforms are very likely to have even more impact on your markets and the cost of your insurance in those markets. So don't just focus only on, on, on exchanges. Focus on these other rules, these other thousands of pages that have just come out. So why are they tied? Well, because if you choose to defer to a federally facilitated exchange, your ability to control many of these other insurance reforms is lessened, significantly lessened. Now, Shakita made a, a very key point there. She said, states retain the, the right to control and regulate if they choose. If they don't choose, who does? Not states. The federal government does. This is a significant thing. And as you as, as dec decision makers and um, potentially regulators and others, that are, are close to your markets, this is something that you have to think about very, very carefully. Finally, where are we gonna end up as we move forward into 2013 when we go live on October 1st, and then again as, as people start to be using the exchanges and we, we roll forward to January 1st, 2014? Well, um, I'll go right through this wave of regulations and go to kind of this slide. So when, we, when the Affordable Care Act was passed and we started to look at the exchanges that were that were contemplated then, that really were um, expansive exchanges, right? And in some states have chosen to, to pursue this. 
Um, they had all the bells and whistles and all the kind of the accessories, if you will, if it were a car. So where are we likely to end up? Well, if, if what was envisioned in the Affordable Care Act was a race car, was a Formula One race car, I would submit to you what's likely to be rolled out is a go-kart. We'll have a go-kart on October 1. Now, this go-kart will do many of the same things that the race car will do, right? Go-karts go around the, the track just like a race car does. Go-karts turn to the right, turn to the left, and I guess you could probably say they meet the need if, if what your objective is to get from point A to point B, but they certainly don't do it as elegantly as the race car Formula One car does. So you, as we roll forward, should expect that you know, when we go forward in, in 2013, this is not going to be a smooth, kind of just elegant, pretty looking thing. It'll get the job done, but given the time frames we're talking about and where we are today, it's likely to be a very minimalist approach first. And those bells and whistles, those, uh, the, you know, the upholstery and accessories are likely to come in future years. So this is a multi-year decision and process, one which I hope that you're engaged in um, with that type of perspective. So with that, I'll close my, my presentation and look forward to the Q&A uh, portion of our, our discussion later.